thanks the Lord. I, I thank God for every person I knew that was in this sanctuary praying for me that I knew of times in their life where God had healed them. He's a God that doesn't change, the Bible said. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when you know who God is, and when you know and realize what the Lord uh, is capable of doing, you can't help but to say at some point during this trial, Lord, you're going you're gonna to heal me. At some point, you're going to turn it around. At some point, uh, you, you're going you're gonna to hear and answer prayer. And so at no time did I ever stop trusting him. But I, I can tell you that when you're in that much pain for that long a stretch of duration of time, the devil can sure plant some, some thoughts in your mind. Not to make me doubt God, but to make me think a lot, a lot of things that weren't so. You know, I had a dream one night I think it's maybe the second night in. I was hurting so bad, and I, I could only get an hour or two at a time. And I went off to sleep. I had a dream that I had a tumor growing around my spine, and they in the dream. I mean, the doctor named it. It, it was some long name, and he named it. So it's wrapped around your spine. I can't, I can't mess with it. I can't treat it. It's inoperable. It's going to spread. It's metastasized. And, you know, it's just you just need to prepare yourself. You're going to die. And I remember in the dream saying to Kim and to the doctor, we was all in the same room together, and I said, well, I've lived my whole life in preparation to die one day. I'm fixing to go to heaven. That's the way it is. I can remember waking up and thinking, man, I hope that, I hope that dream wasn't from God. <laughs> and, uh, so you got to pray that out of your mind every day. But that you know that pray that dream what from God, and uh, the devil plant some some bad thoughts in there, and make you worry over things that that you don't even have to worry about. So the battle, even though you know there's still a battle, that I got to trust God. No, no matter what it is, I got to trust God. And so uh, I, I'm. I'm still uh, needing a miracle, but obviously I'm taking steps in the right direction just to be here tonight. So I'm thankful, thankful tonight for his goodness and his mercy yeah. and his grace. And we're going to allow Sister Pam, her class, to be dismissed tonight. And uh, Good to see Brother Lazarus in service with us tonight. <laughs> That's my inside joke with him. And uh, I got his name mixed up, and uh, Brother JP called me one day and said, Brother so-and-so died. And I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, man, I can't believe it. He just, all of a sudden, I thought it was him. I announced it to the church. We mourned over him, grieved over him. He came about, probably about four or six weeks later, he walked through the back door my my eyes got so big. I said, my, I said, man, you're alive. <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm alive. I said, I thought you had died. I was uh, never so glad to see somebody come to church. I called Brother JP up and told him, and he just laughed. I said, I, I said, I call him Brother Lazarus now. He's, he's risen from the grave. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're going to read tonight out of the book of Romans, chapter number 8. Verse 28, a text that we're very familiar with, we've quoted it many, many, many times, no doubt, as one of the promises of God that we stand upon when things in our life are trying us. And this is one of the verses that I've stood on over the course of the last three weeks. I love the way this verse starts. And we know. Yes, sir. Right. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them 
who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. I, I just titled the message this, God birthed this in my, in my heart when I realized that I might get to come to church and ask God to give me a message to share with you. Tonight, God birthed this thought in my heart. And he said, if you know what's good for you, you'll trust God. Amen. If you know what's good for you, right. you'll trust God. And he said, and we know that all things work together for good. So I know what's good for me, don't I? Amen. I mean, have you ever got threatened by your parents when you was growing up said, you know what's good for you. <laughs> Amen. Well, the Lord kind of made a play of words on that in my heart. And he said, you know what's good for you, so trust me. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. God, we ask you, we believe you. You'll speak to our heart. And God, you'll meet every need that's represented in this house tonight. You know them all. And God, we do know, we know that you're working all things together for our good according to your purpose. God, I pray tonight you'll meet us around this altar. God, I pray that miracles might abound in this house tonight. I need a miracle in my body. There are those that we've been praying for and we continue to pray for that need miracles in their body. God, our nation and the nations of the world are still plagued. God, by a virus burst out of a laboratory, but more properly birthed out of the very pit of hell. God that's killing people left and right. It's caused churches across our land to be shut down. God, I pray against it. I pray against the works of the devil. God, we curse his works and we bind the strong man in Jesus' name. We might spoil his goods. I, I, I pray that during this that the church, oh God, would get a hold of you, that we would Wake up and we would seek you like we never have before and we'd see a revival. God, that what the enemy meant for evil against us, you would turn it about for our good and for your glory. We ask it together in Jesus' name. If you love the Lord, would you say amen? Amen. Possibly no passage in all of the Bible has been more comforting and more consoling to the believer in his hour of trial and difficulty than this verse of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. It is extremely difficult for most of us to see the hand of God in every singular thing that is happening to us during that hour of our life. Most of the trials are what the Bible calls temptations that come to us through human channels are the result of someone's failure or sin. But God is not the author of any of those things. God doesn't bring about those kind of tests or trials. Yet unless he is the agent in all things, we cannot say thy will be done. Whereas God is not the author of those things, God has to allow such things. Some Christians are afraid to trust their all with God for fear that man will hinder God's plan in their life. In order for us to trust God in everything, there has to be a total abandonment of our self-will unto God and our perfect trust in his will. We have to assume or take the attitude that God is in charge of everything that has to do with our life. He has ordered our steps. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. and He delighteth. He delighteth in his way. If I'm walking through the valley, God has ordained my steps. And God delighted to walk me through that valley. When I was reading the story of David confronting the, the giant Goliath, and the Bible said that they 
pitched in the valley of Elah. And I thought, you know, that was probably the lowest valley of those men's lives. They thought that God had ordained the valley for their death and for their sure defeat and destruction. And they hid themselves behind rocks. And as I've done many times, I just wanted to know if the valley of Elah. I wanted to know what Elah meant. And I figured it was probably a clear representation of what God wanted to do in their lives at that time. If God ordains a valley, he had to ordain it for my good That's right. and not for my evil. Come on. Yes. And so the word Elah means an oak of strength. And I said, Lord, what does that mean? And he said, when I ordain a valley in your life, it is to make you strong, not to kill you. Right. That valley had, had been an ordination of David in the eyes of the king and all of his brethren that the Spirit of God was on him. And that he that is in us is greater than he that's in the world. David said, you come to me with spear and shield and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. He was proclaiming not his own strength, not his own wisdom, power, or intellect. He was proclaiming the strength of the Almighty God. Like Sister Megan was testifying, one who, you know, is mighty in battle. Not that particular psalm that they sang but I believe it's in Psalms 14. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He that have clean hands and a pure heart. And he said, open up ye everlasting gates. Open up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Yes. I was quoting that. I'd be hurting so bad. I'd just pace that living room floor couldn't be still. I just walked that floor and pray and cry. And I was quoting that one night. And I said, Lord, you've never lost a battle. Right. Not one time. Not to any enemy. Not to any disease, any sickness, any infirmity. You've never lost. Yeah. There's never been anything too hard for you. Anything you couldn't handle. And I said to the devil, you come against me with infirmity with sickness in my body, but I come against you in the name of the strong Son of God, and I stand on the promise of his word. When I found out that it was a vertebrae in my neck, I, I began to quote some of the craziest uh, things in the Bible that may be crazy to somebody that's well, but I quoted the verse that has always represented Calvary so that the scripture might be full. Fulfilled, the Bible said uh, when they came to break the legs of Jesus, uh, he was already dead. Yeah. And so instead of breaking his legs, so the scripture might be fulfilled that uh, not one of his bones uh, would be broken. They just thrust a spear in his, in his side. But the psalmist said it like this, uh, that, the, that God would keep all of his bones uh, and not one of them would be broken. And I said, Lord, uh, you can, you, you're the keeper of every bone in my body and just push that one back into place. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Just, you, you keep all my bones. Uh, just press that, uh, that vertebrae back where it got eight millimeters uh, herniated, setting into that nerve bed. I said, Lord, eight millimeters is the difference between joy and misery. Eight millimeters. Just that much is all I need the Lord to work and to move in my life. Just a, a, about the size of a grain of a mustard seed, Lord. That's all I need. Yeah. And you'll put me in total joy and peace. I believe he can do it. Yeah. You have to believe that not only can he do it, but he will do it. We have to assume and take the attitude that God is in control of everything that has to do with anyone who loves him. To the Christian, everything comes directly from the hand of God, no matter who or what might have been the apparent agent. If one limits uh, his views to the present and thinks only of immediate happiness, 
that it's impossible to explain our text. All things work together for good to them that love God. If our faith is never tested, then it's as good as food that's never eaten. Come on. If our faith is never tried or tested, it's as good as clothes that's never been worn, a car that's never been driven, a house that's never been lived in. God gets glory from our faith. When you sing those hymns, they were all birthed out of trial, all birthed out of temptation. All birthed out of hardship and difficulty. Where could I go but to the Lord? Somebody's faith had to be tried and tested. And out of that comes the glorious revelation that Christ is good to his word. Christ can be trusted. His promises are yes and amen. He'll, he'll be a friend that sticks closer than any brother. You can trust him. He won't fail you. He'll never let you down. The word of God is from everlasting to everlasting. And you don't have to search very far. And you won't really have to wait very long to find out God does not, cannot, will not lie. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh, the first point I want to bring to our attention tonight, number one, all things work together for our good. Notice first the extent of the things that are being specified. All things. I'm glad he didn't say most things or some things or a few things. If so, if he would have said most things, the one thing that I come up against in life, the devil would say, this is that one thing that's not going to work for your good this time. But I'm glad he didn't leave the devil an inch. He gave no place to the devil and neither should we. All things work together for our good. This means all things in heaven. That means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and even his angels. All things on earth, meaning trials, temptations, persecutions, health, the sickness, prosperity, and adversity. I, it's hard for me to imagine that Joe Biden could be good for America because I don't think he is. But he's probably good for the church because he makes us to wake up and realize we need God. I told you, Eight millimeters is the difference between health and misery and one goofball in the wrong office is the difference between a nation that prospers and a nation that forgets God. Amen. All things in heaven, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and his angels, all things on earth. Trials, temptations, persecutions, health, sickness, prosperity, and adversity. All these things are working together for good to those who love God. Some things appear to work for the good and others for evil. But those who love God, it doesn't say some for good and some for evil. If you love God, then all things are working out for your good. God will take what the devil threw against you for evil and he'll turn it for your good. The greatest example of it is Jacob of old. In the Bible, they, or Joseph rather, they threw that boy in a pit to sold him into slavery. He was bought by Potiphar, lied on by Potiphar's wife, cast into a dungeon, no doubt with the threat of a death sentence hanging over his head. Oh, but God... God was only preserving that boy who at the age of 17 years old was sold into slavery by his brother, but at the age of 30 was promoted by God to the second seed in all of the land of Egypt and would be the salvation of his dad and of his brothers and for the nation of Israel as a whole. What he didn't realize through the 13 years he was walking through the misery 
of the dark cloud of oppression. He was walking through the dark shadows where the enemy had lied to him and said, God has forgotten you. God will leave you to rot in this prison. The God that you uh, saved yourself for. If you would have uh, uh, lain with Potiphar's wife, uh, you could still be in prosperity and still be doing good. But no, you you preserved your integrity. No, you kept your purity. No, no. You, you, you maintained your testimony. But where did that get you? Look how you're suffering. Look where God has left you. He warred all of that out of his mind. And he trusted in the fact God is love. God is faithful. God is true. God is good. And 13 years later, he's sitting in the second seat to, to Pharaoh and he sees his brothers walk through the door and he realized only then at that moment, uh, brethren, what you meant uh, unto me for harm, what you meant unto me for evil, God meant it for good. God threw me in the dungeon. God saved me and prepared me to make room for you in Egypt and to spare all my household. It was God's doings all along. If we could only see Jacob in his, or Joseph in his trouble and see ourselves in his place uh, and say, though I know, I know it seems like it is hopeless. Uh, I know it seems like the devil has the upper hand, uh, but really God is going to turn this thing for my good. Amen. 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 Come on. He said, and we know we receive this assurance through the scripture. For the whole teaching of God's word implies this truth. Not a sparrow, he said in Matthew 10 and 29. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without our heavenly father noticing it. Even the very number of the hair upon our head are all numbered by God. The number of graves have greatly increased. And God knows the count of them. Right, that's right. Amen. Paul also told us in Philippians 4 and 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. By this he simply meant, We don't have to worry about anything because God is taking care of of everything. Yes, Woo! Man, I was sure thankful when God said that to me. Right. You don't have to worry about anything because God's taking care of everything. Good. I'm not going to lose sleep over Joe Biden. Because the Bible said the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand. He puts them up and he casts them down. Right. Not one plan God has ever made for the church. Not one promise God ever made to the church. Not to the believer in Afghanistan, nor to the believer in Foley, Alabama, can be thwarted or stopped or conquered by the devil. If God said it, he will make good on that promise. Amen. I'm thankful tonight that uh, Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi cannot cancel out God's promise. In the words of Jesus, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In Matthew 6 and 34, he said there's enough evil today for you to worry about or to have to deal with and to worry about what tomorrow is going to bring. He said, let tomorrow take care of the things of tomorrow for sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And by this, he simply says that God has set himself as our defense. He is our fortress. He is our shield and buckler. The shadow of a great rock, the Bible said, in a weary land. A, 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 a refuge from the storm. Rivers of water he becomes in the dry and thirsty land. 
He's our refuge and our strength. The word of God tells us in Romans 8 and 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, God's on my side. I can't lose. We shall not want, for he's our shepherd, the psalmist said. There's no need to fear, for the Lord is on our side. He has promised in Isaiah 43 and 2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Yeah. Notice, he did not promise that you would never have to pass through the water. Right. He said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. Right. When you walk through the fire, not if you walk through the fire, but when you are made to walk through the fire, you will not be burned. You know what that means for me? The fire won't mark my life. I'm not going to, if the Lord tarries another 10 years and I'm still alive and I'll, I'll have been serving God for 37 years, if that be the case. Uh, at the end of 37 years, uh, somebody asked me to stand up and testify. I'm not going to stand up and say, oh, my God, I remember in 2021, in August, when I had that back trouble. It was the worst uh, year of my life. I remember from 2019, uh, from that moment when our house burned, then the attack on uh, my family, and then the attack on my person. Oh, it was the worst two years of my life. My life is not marred. My life is not marked uh, by the fire that I passed through. My life is marked uh, by the fact uh, I went through it uh, with God Almighty. Yeah. You walk through the fire, but it won't scar you. Yeah. It won't uh, mark you. That won't be your testimony. Your yeah. testimony will be I kept you. Your testimony will be I brought you through it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Your testimony will be your praise. It'll be your rejoicing. It'll be your faith. It'll be your victory. Right. Amen. Amen. When you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. God rules over the kingdoms of men. And in his hand, there's power and might. There's none able to withstand him. The psalmist said of God in Psalms 89 and 9, Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. He said in Psalms 135 and 6, Whatsoever the Lord pleased that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas, and all the deep places. I want to tell you, not COVID, not Pelosi, not Biden, not every demon or Democrat can stop the hand of God from moving in the life of the believer. What the devil meant for our evil, God will turn it for our good. Number two, good. I ain't preached in three weeks, so y'all let me preach, okay? Hallelujah. Go ahead. All things are working for our good. And secondly, our lives are under God's control. Yes, sir. The question is asked in Isaiah 40 and verse 28, Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There's no searching of his understanding. All power is in the hand of our God. And the Christian's life is under his complete control. Nothing can happen to the child of God except it be with the knowledge and the permission of our heavenly Father. Psalm 91 bears that out to be the truth. He said in verses 4 through 7, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth, 
My God, shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by the by night, uh, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor, listen to this, uh, nor for the pestilence, uh, just put COVID in there, will you? Nor for the COVID that walketh uh, in darkness, uh, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. The reason for this is given in the following verses, verses 9 through 11. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Nothing happens to the child of God. But that which must first climb the mountains of God's presence to get to us. The scripture says in, in uh, Psalms 125 and verse 2 is the mountains are round about Jerusalem so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth forevermore. My God, that'll make anybody that believes God want to shout. I said nothing can happen to the child of God unless it first climbs uh, God's mountain to get to us. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth forever. I don't believe that's a mountain that hell can climb. Come on, Christ. Amen. Say it. I don't believe that's a mountain that hell can climb. Yeah. Nothing can reach you except it first leaps over the fiery walls of his presence. In Zechariah 2 and 5, For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. I don't believe the devil's brave enough to try to walk through that fire. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's no power on this earth that can touch a soul that abides in Jesus Christ without first receiving his permission. God has a hedge around his people. Satan detected that when he tried to attack Job. Job 1 and 10, he said, Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he had on every side? If that's true, then nothing can get to us. Nothing can disturb us. Nothing can harm us except it has to pass through the surrounding halo of God's glory that surrounds and encompasses us. When God sees that it's best for us, or when he wants hardship, difficult uh, trials, uh, ad adversities uh, to grow us, when he wants to use those things to advance us, or to increase our faith, or to show his glory, Lord, why is that boy born blind? Did he sin or did his parents sin that he'd be born blind? The Lord said, neither did he sin nor did his mom and daddy sin, but he was born blind. I want to use that boy to reveal to the whole world I can open up a blinded eye. Sometimes hardships, trials, difficulties, just hellish circumstances will be allowed to touch your life to show the whole world you are an overcomer yeah. by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. You can't be defeated. Your joy can't be stolen. Your victory is not for sale. God wants the world to know it. Hallelujah. God had no part of me stumping my toe on that dresser at the house. That was all me. I believe it was John Wayne that said, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. I felt like that's the dumbest thing I have ever done. I looked, I fell down on the ground, 
closed my eyes, wincing in pain. I told Kim, I said, I broke my toe. She said, oh, you just stubbed it. It most likely ain't broke. I peeped one eye open and looked down there at it, and it was pointed that way. I said, oh, yeah, it is broke. <laughs> she walked in there and looked at it. She said, come on, let's go to the hospital. Let's go to the hospital. Oh, mercy. I, I know God didn't do that, but God allowed either me to do that or the devil to do that to me to show somebody you can shout with a broke toe. <laughs> Woo! You can shout the victory with a broke toe. Yes. Amen. I'm glad to be shouting the victory tonight. God has a purpose in everything that affects us. He takes special notice of all things that happen to his children and then regulates those things according to his perfect will, regardless of their origin. That's the reason the Apostle Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 12 and 10, I take pleasures in infirmities. God talked about he would have himself a peculiar people. I still read that I take pleasure in infirmities. And I want to ask the Apostle Paul, what kind of man are you? <laughs> I count it all joy when these things come against me for his name's sake. Have you reached that spiritual plateau in your life where you count it all joy when every devil in hell is coming against you. Count it all joy when you can't catch a breath for the pain that's attacking your body for the space of three weeks. Just count it all joy. He said, I take pleasure in infirmities. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Romans 5 and 3. He said in Hebrews 12 and 11, now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. So he, he was human. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. In other words, if you let it work for your good and God's glory, God is going to bring a glory or the fruit of righteousness out of it. James said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, that is, into many different tests and trials. Again, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 1 Peter 1 and 7, that the trial or the testing of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Faith uh, increases. Faith uh, grows in value. It increases in size and in stature when it is put in the fire. That's good. Gold when a goldsmith put gold in the melting pot, all of the dross, that is all of the metals or material that was not pure gold, gold is the heaviest of all precious metals. It weighs more than any other metal. So when you melt gold, the pure gold stays in the bottom and all that that's not gold, he would take the ladle, it was called dross, and he skimmed it off the top. And he knew he had skimmed all the dross off when he could see his own reflection in the pot because gold is transparent when it's pure gold. It gives off a reflection like that of a mirror so he would skim all the dross off. Now when you put gold in the fire, 
it decreases in size because uh, you've taken metals out of it. It decreases uh, in weight because you've taken metals out of it. It decreases in strength because gold is very soft. It's very pliable. The, the, the more pure you get gold, the easier it is to bend or to break. It's very fragile. He said, but our faith is not so. When it's put into the fire, it don't decrease, it increases. When you put faith through the fire, it doesn't become weaker. It, be oh God, it becomes stronger. Hallelujah. Even in your persecution and your reproaches, God will work those for your good. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, he said, Happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And then he said, On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. This is also manifest the Sermon on the Mount. This is the reason Jesus could advise his disciples Matthew 5 11 and 12 blessed are ye when men shall revile you persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven last point curse your help now I'm finished God works he said first all things are working for our good secondly our lives are under God's control and third God works in apparent adversity. Several scriptural examples show God working out his plan in the lives of men and women in the midst of apparent adversity. When Joseph was sold into slavery as a result of his brother's jealousy, I imagine it was difficult for him to see the hand of God during that moment in his life that step by step God revealed his will to Joseph and although it took 13 years for him to complete his plan God has difficulty with some of us because we're not willing to wait on him you imagine waiting on God to reveal 13 years of hell it's really not hell at all it's 13 years of God about to elevate you. God about to make you great. Not only in his eyes, but in the eyes of all those around you. Some of us aren't willing to wait, but Isaiah said, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wait. I say on the Lord. We must learn to walk by faith and not by sight to follow our Lord one step at a time. It was sin on the part of Joseph's brethren that caused them to sell him. But God turned the evil work of his brethren to the greatest blessing of Joseph's entire life. In fact, Joseph said to his brethren, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. In this case, God made even the wrath of man to praise him. I don't know how he'll do it, but God will use the evil Democrats of our lifetime. He'll turn it on the church for his glory. In our nation's most difficult times, you're going to find out God has a church. You're going to find out God has 7,000 that have never bowed the knee to Baal. Hallelujah. Some things that seem to be adversaries to you are actually unrevealed blessing. God has kept some things hidden from our human earthly view until he desires to reveal it to us. And that doesn't mean they don't exist. If the sun is being eclipsed by the moon, it doesn't mean that the sun is not shining, only it has been veiled or covered up. When dark clouds of our lives cover God's 
radiance. Remember the scripture. 2 Chronicles 6 and 1, the Lord had said that he would dwell in thick darkness. Though you can't see him. Remember, he's not a God who's afar off, but a God who is at hand. A God who promised, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. When Joseph was sold into Egypt, Simeon was commanded to be held in custody. He said, when you bring Benjamin back and let me see your youngest brother, Benjamin, I'll know that you've spoken the truth to me and you haven't lied to me, that you're not spies. He knew they weren't spies. Benjamin was his whole brother. The rest were all half-brothers. He and Benjamin were very close, and he wanted to see Benjamin. He said, I'm going to hold Simeon here in Egypt, in jail, in prison. You're going to go home. You're going to tell your dad to let Benjamin come back with you and them. I'll give you corn and wheat and wine and send you back. Save you and your family, not till you bring Benjamin back. That was the message they, that Joseph sent his brothers home with. And in Genesis 42 and 36, these are the words of Jacob, who had already lost his favorite son, Joseph. And then his second favorite was Benjamin. Those were the two sons of Rachel, the love of his life. He said, you've already took Joseph from me. He said, now you want to take Benjamin son of my old age away from me too and in verse 36 of chapter 42 he said all these things are against me all these things are against me what God was trying to scream from the heavens and Jacob couldn't hear for all the sorrow that filled his heart you mean a ruler of Egypt wants my baby boy. Simeon's in prison. You want me to give my baby boy? All these things are against me. What well, God was trying to say, no. If you knew what was good for you, you'd trust me. All things work together for good to them that love God. When he realized that if he kept Benjamin, they had starved to death, he allowed him to go. But if Jacob had only known all of these things are not against him, all of these things are now working together for his good. And God is using these things that he said were against him to preserve him and his family through a famine and to preserve the entire nation of Israel. As far as Jacob was concerned, the clouds of sorrow were hanging low. He realized that God always works out his will in the lives of those who led him. If he would have realized that before he got summoned to Egypt, he would have been rejoicing all the while. I don't know how long it took for them to get from where they were to Egypt with Benjamin. Joseph reveals himself. Jacob sends them all home laden down with loads of goods and the brethren said, Dad, you just thought all this time Joseph was dead. He's alive. That was Joseph. He put Simeon in prison and it was Joseph that wanted to see Benjamin. He's calling for you come to Egypt. He's got a city, the city of Goshen prepared for us. We're going to dwell there. He's going to take care of us. I don't know how many weeks or how many months it took for that round trip to happen, but instead of the worry and the pain and the anguish and the torment and the devil saying to Jacob, all these things are against you. He could have only seen it from God's point of view. From the Apostle Paul's point of view. All things are working together for your good. You don't have to wait.
until the end unfolds. You don't have to wait till a nation shaking revival is birthed and your family members are saved and born again and you see this miracle or that. You don't have to wait until while Joe Biden's president, while the wicked Nancy Pelosi is doing everything in her power to destroy this nation and the church. You can go ahead and rejoice like you've already read the end of the book. God is going to work on our behalf. Yeah. And there's nothing the devil can do to stop it. You're able to stand with me. I've often shared the testimony of the psalm where the missionary's wife was serving on the foreign field her husband died the support for the ministry ceased they had to come home the women couldn't find a place in the workforce back then she had no means of support from the church because her husband wasn't there to be preaching anymore. People seemingly had forgotten them. She was renting a little house and in the backyard there was a swing set, a rope, a tire hanging down out of a tree and the daughter was in that tire swinging back and forth. They were out of food, no groceries, she didn't know where next meal would come from the bottom the sole of her daughter's shoe was flapping in the wind exposing her little bare foot when the swing would come up she just began to weep and cry she said Lord I don't have nobody to turn to I don't have anywhere else to go you're my life you're my support you're my hope you don't help us. We don't have any groceries. She said, Lord, I'm asking you today send somebody, anybody, our way. Help me to feed my daughter. She said, Lord, it's not asking too much. My daughter needs a new pair of shoes. While she's praying, there's a knock at the door, and she goes to the door, wiping tears from her eyes, opens the door, and there's nobody there. And she looks down the ground, there's numerous sackfuls of groceries. The groceries are just piling up out of the top of the bag. There's just bag after bag after bag. Months worth of groceries. She walks through, wades through the bags, and she looks both sides of the yard and there's nobody and she runs out to the roadside and there's not a car tailing away there's not anybody walking the street she runs around the backyard and asks her daughter have you seen him is anybody back here has anybody walked to the yard have you seen anybody no mom nobody she said come around to the front and help me they started bringing those groceries in and unloading all those groceries into the pantry and her daughter said, Mom, where'd all the food come from? She began to weep. And she said, God heard my prayer, baby. They, they came from the Lord. While I was praying, there was a knock at the door. They're just here. They had, they had to have came from God. They unloaded and they got to the last bag. Pulled the last little bit of food out and there was a, you guessed it a shoe box in the bottom of the last bag. She said, Mom, there's a box. She said, open it, baby, and see what's inside. A brand new pair of shoes. She said, can I try them on? She said, try them on, baby. Just the perfect right size fit. The daughter was smiling, leaping for joy. She said, Mom, can I go outside and play in my new shoes? She said, go outside and play, baby run outside, got back on that swing, was swinging so big with a smile, and that missionary's wife standing out the window looking 
begin to pen the words, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to know, just to know, thus saith the Lord, amen. If you're able tonight, I want to call you to this altar. No matter what's working against you, don't be like Jacob. He couldn't see what was on the other side of his misery and his trial and his tests, his adversities. He said, all things in my life are against me. What he couldn't see was, no, all these things are against you. All these things are working for you. I'm about to reveal my glory through all these things. Hallelujah. You're going to die in faith knowing that I keep every promise that I ever made. I'm going to fulfill my word through you and all your descendants. I'm a God who cannot fail and who does not lie. Would you meet me around this altar tonight? Let's thank him for his faithfulness. Let's trust him wholeheartedly. Let's believe it in spite of our difficulties. Believe him in spite of 